Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. I'm going to give you three scriptures I want you to turn to. I want you to put a thumb in each one. That'll be a little difficult, I think. But Psalm 91, 13. Luke 10, 19. And Colossians 2, 15. Psalm 91, 13. It says, You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent, you shall trample underfoot. Today we're going to talk about how you can get control of your life. Too many people are living with everything else around them controlling them. And they feel like they've lost control of their own life. They're doing what everybody else wants done. They're living everybody else's life. They're doing stuff for everybody else. But it seems like you have no life of your own. Today we're going to talk about how to get control of an uncontrolled life or a life that's controlled by somebody else. See, the Bible says in Galatians 5, and 23 that when we become born again, the fruit of the Spirit lives inside of us. And when you ask somebody what the fruit of the Spirit is, most of the time they'll say love, joy, peace, etc. Well, there's nine parts to the fruit of the Spirit. And the ninth part there in verse 23 is self-control. See, God wants you to control yourself. <laughs> I, I remember sometimes with children, you say, would you please control yourself? But as adults, there's no excuse because God has given us all the equipment required so that we can live a controlled life, doing what he wants done and receiving the blessings that he has for us. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. You should not have other things trampling you. According to the word of God, you are to be the trampler. When the enemy comes at you, now it says the lion, the young lion. Well, we know in the Bible when it's talking about the lion, many times it's talking about the Lion of Judah. And who is the Lion of Judah? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. He is, he is our source. He is our source of power. He, he is the Lion of Judah. But 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's wanting to devour you. He's seeking, he's looking to find out who he can devour. And he may look like, <clears throat> he may look like a lion. I said he may look like a lion. He walks around like a roaring lion. But he is not a lion. He is just pretending to be a lion. You can be the president of an organization or you can act like you're the president of an organization. But the one who makes the decisions is the president. Doesn't matter how you act. If you're not it, you're not it. Well, the devil's not a lion. He is a liar, but he's not a lion. But he walks about and he looks like one. And he is a deceiver. And he's trying to make you think that he is a lion. That he has control over you. He tries to put fear inside of you by what you see because you see this lion coming against you and you're thinking, what can I do? But you must remember, he is not a lion. And Psalm 91, 13 says that the lion should, we, we need to trample the lion and, and the snakes underfoot. Why? How can we do that? Because a lion is ferocious. It's big. Did I tell you he is not a lion? He just walks around pretending to be. He's a pretender. He's walking around pretending to be a lion. And when he comes against you, 
you don't need to see him as a lion you need to see him by what God said he is the Word of God says we walk by faith and not by sight you don't go by what you see when the enemy comes against you you go by what God says God says he's he's a, a worm he has been defeated the scripture says that Jesus came to earth to defeat the works of the devil for this reason the Son of Man was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil you think Jesus did what he came to do or did he or did Jesus fail no Jesus did what he came to do so the devil has been defeated and we are the ones who get to carry out the authority over him you say well what authority do I have over him well that takes us to our next verse Luke 10 19 behold I give you this is this is red letter in your Bible Behold, I give you authority over all the, what? I give you authority to what? Trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing, that word nothing used to be, in Old English, it used to be two words. It used to be no thing. No thing shall by any means hurt you. So when that lion comes against you, that lion lion that comes against you don't be afraid of what you see because you don't go by what you see you go by what God says you walk by faith and not by sight and you have been given authority over all his power does he have power he has whatever power you let him have but you have authority over the power of the enemy and you can stand strong and tall knowing that no thing, nothing, no thing by any means will harm you. You say, you mean I can't get hurt? I said, well, I believe what the Word says. Let me ask you this. Do you believe Jesus? You're asking me, is that true? Well, no, don't ask me. I'm just quoting him. That's what Jesus said. So ask him if what he said is true. I'll just give you a moment. What do you think the answer is going to be? He would say, this is going to be a long conversation. You can make me repeat everything again. <laughs> Believe me the first time, no thing will by any means hurt you. Now, let's go to the next scripture, Colossians 2.15. We're talking about how to get control of a runaway life. Somebody else is running away with it. How many of you have dreams and visions of things that you want to get done in life, but it just seems because of all the circumstances, you just can't get it done? If God's given you a dream, then he wants you to fulfill it. If there's something in your life that's been going wrong, God wants it to go right. Colossians 2.15, having disarmed principalities and powers. Now, is, do we have anybody in here that's ever taken an English language class in school? Ever. All right. Well, Brian, for you, since you didn't raise your hand, I'll tell Oh, he did. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you this. I'll ask you this question. Is, is disarmed past tense? Is that, is that a past tense word? Well, Jesus then, having in the past disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. The devil has been defeated. You may say, well, why is he here doing stuff in my life? Let me tell you something. The stuff he's doing in your life, now, you promise me you won't get offended? Okay. I'll say it anyway. You are the gatekeeper for your life. And we've all made mistakes in the past. And in the past, we've let the devil in. We've, we've, let, we've let snakes in our house. But I'm saying starting today, you can close the door, keep out the devil, and get control of your life again. Wouldn't it be able, wouldn't it be nice to just be able to make a decision that something God's told you to do and just do it? Hmm. Well, you say, <clears throat> how much authority do I have? 
Let me give you an example. You have to take the Word of God with some spiritual common sense. And there's a lot of Christians out there, good, well-meaning Christians, who have taken things out of context, and they're just going crazy. Trying to do things that the wor Word doesn't say they can do, and then not doing things that the Word says they can do. And we balance Scripture with Scripture, but, but let's think of it this way. Let's say, for example, you're going to be going on a trip, and you have a friend, and your friend says, do you want me to watch your house? And you say, sure. Why don't you, I'm going to be gone for a month. Why don't you come over, watch my house, you can live in my house. And uh, the person says, well, what can I do? And you say, hey, look, just do whatever you want. I'll be gone. I know you. I give you authority to just do whatever you want. So you go on your month vacation, you visit your friend in Australia, whatever it is you're going to do. You come back, and you walk in your house, and you notice that there's big holes three foot wide in your sheetrock in almost every room. Your TVs are all mashed, and they're in the center of the floor. The light fixtures are pulled out, and wires are hanging out of the wall. And you're saying, why did you do this? And they said, well, you said I could do anything I wanted. Now, are you following me? God has given us authority on this earth, but we need to know the limits of the authority by using spiritual common sense. You need to know what you have authority over and what you don't have authority over. But one thing that you need to understand that you do have authority over is you. Nobody has any more authority over you than you. And if you don't want the sheetrock knocked out in your house, it, you, then shut the door, keep out the devil, and if you let anybody in, make sure that they understand the rules. Look, God's not wanting any more out of you than what he wanted out of Adam and Eve. In Genesis 2.15, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. That's what God wants you to do with your house. He wants you to tend and keep it. Now, your house is your area, but your house is also your body. I said your house is your body, and your body is the temple. According to Scripture, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Paul said, don't you know this, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? The way you treat yourself. See, sometimes people don't have, to ha don't have to be concerned about other people treating them bad because they're treating themselves bad, so bad. Did you know people can beat themselves up? And people can use the weirdest things as excuses for the way they are. Genesis 1, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. <clears throat> that word dominion comes from the word dominate. God's plan for man on this earth was to dominate this earth. Not for this earth to dominate us. For us to dominate this earth. Over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, and every creeping thing, every creep on this earth. Every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, <clears throat> God has never lost his authority over the earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It's his. He owns it all. But he gave authority over dominion on the earth to Adam. And he told Adam, to tend and keep it. And Adam, through a series of events, and you all know the story, got tricked out of his authority. And you remember Jesus was talking with Satan. Actually, Satan was tempting Jesus. 
And he said, behold, I, I'll, I'll give you authority. Remember when, when Lucifer said that, when Satan said that to Jesus? He said, I, I'll give you authority. What was he talking about? He was talking about the authority that man had relinquished. See, when Jesus died and went into Hades and proclaimed victory and led captivity captive and opened up the bosom of Abraham in paradise and the saints went to heaven, the graves were open. Let me tell you something. He, he took everything he disarmed. He disarmed the principalities and powers. He, there is no authority left in them. Anything that they, that Lucifer tricked out of Adam, too bad, so sad. He doesn't have it anymore. And then Jesus turned around and gave authority to us. So we have, right now, we have the authority that Adam had. And we have no excuse. You know, there's, there's scriptures to talk about. We are without excuse. We have no excuse for letting things happen on this earth. I'll remind you of when the Space Challenger blew up. The nun from the convent in St. Louis wrote me a letter and said, why did God blow up the space shuttle? And she said, and if he didn't do it, which is what I expect you to say, why did he allow it? And I told her. God didn't do it, and God didn't allow it. She said, well, who did? And I said, we did. Because we have authority on this earth. And it may have been a mistake that somebody made, but ultimately, listen to this, you can't blame God. You can't blame God for the sorry mess you're in. Do you guys still love me? Okay. <clears throat> we can't blame God. James 1.17 says every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father. If it's not good, it's not God. John 10.10 says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God's not the thief. He's not the thief. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Then he goes on to say, Jesus said this, but I have come that you might have life. Hallelujah. See, he came to give us life. The enemy comes to give us death. And what do we get? We get what we choose. The scripture says, I place before you life and death. Then like we're morons or something, God has to tell us which one to choose. I place before you life and death. Uh, choose life. God's doing everything he can to get us to choose life. Yeah, in Luke 4, 6, the devil said to Jesus, all this authority I will give you and their glory. For this has been delivered to me, and I'll give it to whomever I wish. I used to think that that wasn't exactly the way that was. In fact, I've taught otherwise. But I got to thinking about this. Jesus didn't come back at him and say, you don't have any authority to give me. If the devil had no authority to give Jesus. See, Jesus came to earth. We got to remember this. Jesus is was and will always be the Son of God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because the Father and I are one. But he came to earth as the Son of Man, born of a woman. And he set aside all of his Son of Godship. And he operated on earth as the Son of Man. The same anointing that Jesus had, we can have. The same Holy Spirit that came upon him can come upon us. In fact, he even said, greater works than I do, will you do? But Jesus took back that authority. The devil doesn't have it anymore. Who has it now? Who has it now? We do. All right. Jesus gave the authority to all who believe. Look at this. Mark 16, verse 17. And these signs shall follow some of those who believe. Oh, wait, no, excuse me. Let me mark that out. And these signs shall follow those who believe. In my name they will what? You have authority over demons. You say, well, I just don't, 
I don't believe demons exist. I, I believe that, you know, that was just kind of metaphorically when Jesus was here on earth. Now, listen to me. Jesus didn't cast out concepts. This, and listen to this. The same demons that were here on the earth when Jesus was here, they're still here. They're not on vacation. They're still here. The thousands of demons that came out of the pigs when the pigs ran off the cliff, where are they? They're on the earth. Some of them may have been talking to you at some point in time. We have authority over them. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. That's good news. I said, that's good news. That's real good news. Now, here's where people take things out of context. They said, well, you know, we can take up serpents and scorpions and nothing by, will by any means harm us. James, next week, bring a couple rattlers to church. Oh, come on. You know, no. You don't test God. You don't tempt God. I said, you don't tempt God. You don't test God. Now that we have this authority, can we agree we have this authority? Now what? God expects the same thing out of us that he expected out of Adam. He wants us to tend and keep the garden. In other words, we are responsible for ourselves and where we live. Your household is under your control. You can't watch X-rated movies all week long and then come to church on Sunday and three hallelujahs and an amen brother gets it all okay. Boy, it got quiet in this Presbyterian church here. Evangelism and hearing from God starts at home. Ephesians 4.11. Let's put that scripture up. Ephesians 4.11. It says, He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. This is what many people in the ministry refer to as the five-fold ministry, the five different branches, so to speak, of people who are called into the ministry. And it says that some people are going to be apostles and some are going to be prophets and some pastors, and some teachers, wow, and some even evangelists. Why? Why? Look at the next verse, verse 12. Ephesians 4, 12. 1, 2. 4, colon, 1, 2. Ephesians, right there. For the equipping, here's why. Why did he give us evangelists, prophets, and teachers and pastors and all that. Why? For the equipping of the saints. That's the body of Christ. That's all of us. That's me and you guys. For the equipping of the saints. Why? For the work of the ministry. What was the what's the work of the ministry? These signs shall follow those who believe. They'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. They'll speak with new tongues. Nothing's going to harm them. They'll cast out demons. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, and the word edify means to build up the body of Christ. So who is supposed to be doing all this stuff? All of us. Yes, it's okay to call me and say, and, and this happened several times this week. We have people call and they say, I, I've got so-and-so with me and, and I'd like to have prayer, you know. Uh, could you pray with us on the phone? Could we... We even had people bring people in this week who had been told they were terminal, brought them into the church. I, yes, I love it. I'll lay hands on them. I'll anoint them with oil. I'll pray the prayer of faith, and we believe that they're healed. But that's not something that just the pastor does. Now, listen, don't get all wobbly neat on me. It's your responsibility, too. Every one of us in this room. If you're a born-again believer, if you're a born-again believer, then you have been given authority over all the power of the enemy, and you have the ability and the right and the privilege and actually the command 
to lay hands on the sick for them to recover. You say, well, what if nothing happens? That's, that's not your responsibility. You can't make other people receive. You can't wonder why something happened. No, you do what you're supposed to do. God does what he says he will do. And there may be other things. Let me tell you something. There, there are things that's going on in other people's lives you have no idea that they're going on in their life. I'm serious. There, there's things going on in people's lives and you have no idea. I don't care how close you are. I don't care if they live in your house. There's things going on in people's lives that you don't know about. And you... When you lay hands on somebody, you do what God tells you to do. And your concern is not whether they receive or not. I've, I've actually been in situations where I've been in the hospital and I laid hands on somebody uh, because they, they and the family asked me to come in and lay hands on them to receive healing. And I've gone in and I've anointed them with oil, laid hands on them and, and said, be healed in the name of Jesus, which is all you have to do. And, you know, you don't have to preach a sermon. You don't have to know 49 scriptures. You know, you just need to know what you're supposed to do. Just lay hands on them and say, be healed in the name of Jesus. That's what the Bible said to do. You do what the Bible says to do. God does what he says he'll do. And I've heard people that I've laid hands on. This actually happened to me once across the street. The person says, thank you. I, I, thank you for, I, I believe I'm healed. I believe I'm healed. And I get out in the hallway, and one of their family members comes out and says, as soon as you left the room, they said, Whew, I couldn't keep that up, you know. Uh, they, they said, you know, they just put on a good show for you because you're the pastor. Because really, you know, as, as soon as I said, you, in the name of Jesus, be healed, you're healed. They go, thank you, Jesus. And then I walk out of the room, and they go, sure hope it works. I wonder, what, what if it doesn't? That's not faith. You know, faith is not something, well, let's just throw it up against the wall and see if it works, see if it sticks. I've had people actually say to me, Pastor, I've, I've been to the doctor, and I, I have no problem with going to the doctor. <clears throat> They're trying to do the same thing that we want. Doctors are trying to get you well. <clears throat> Excuse me. But... Uh, I've had people actually say to me, Pastor, I've been to the doctor. I've taken the medication. I've taken the treatments. I've, I've done everything. I've changed my diet. I've done everything, and nothing has worked. So might as well try prayer. Here I am. Now, it's, it's not like, well, we've tried everything else. I mean, we are at our wits' end. I guess we're going to have to try and see if prayer works. It's not just something that you see if it works. You believe that it does work. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We receive what we believe, not what we try. You know, I think I'll give salvation a try and see how it works. No, we don't do that. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That, and there's a qualifier there, whoever believes. Whoever believes will not perish, but have everlasting life. What do you have to do to receive? You've got to believe. All right. But it, it can't just be something that you only believe when you're at church. You are the gatekeeper of, gatekeeper of your life. You decide what comes in and what goes out. You decide what comes in your ears, what comes in your eyes, what goes out of your mouth. See, I would venture to say that probably for the last couple of hours that none of you have been doing drugs or smoking weed or, you know, drinking real heavy or have you. <laughs> a few weeks ago, we did find some beer cans in the bathroom. And it was a ladies' bathroom, by the way. Yeah, those, those women. Well, you know... <laughs> Oh, that'll get me a couple of emails, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, why not? Well, because, you say, well, I'm at church. I'm not going to cuss while I'm at church. I'm not going to use the F word while I'm at church. Not in God's house. 
But what about your house? Is your house God's house? You know, if you wouldn't use the F word here or sit in here and watch a movie with the F word, why would you sit at home and watch a movie with the F word? When the F word comes on in a movie I'm watching, that's when I start watching a different movie. You say, well, it doesn't affect me. Oh, get over yourself. Come on. As Andy Griffith would say, come on. It, it does too. You, you, know, you know what you believe? It's what you constantly hear. You hear it and you hear it and you hear it. Look, even Hitler knew this. He said, you tell people a lie enough times, you keep telling them that lie and telling them that lie and telling them that lie, and after a while, they become brainwashed, and they believe it. You know, there's a lot of Christians that need their brain washed and their mouth washed. You say, well, you're a little old-fashioned. Well, I'm old enough to be old-fashioned. You know, the devil wants to destroy you. He's against you. He hates righteousness. And he'll do everything he can to cause you to try to live an unrighteous life. Remember, be sober, be vigilant. You ever think about that, be sober? It's actually in the Bible, be sober. You know, most murders, sexual abuse, Most of those types of activities take place in a home. All right. That was my introduction. <laughs> and now we're down to the meat of the sermon, which I think I'm just going to be able to give you the points. All right? I don't know if you have a pencil and paper out. If you don't, see if you can remember these. But I'm going to give you quickly, quickly, and, and keep in mind, for the people from Florissant, uh, my version of quickly may not line up with your version of quickly. <laughs> but relatively quick, I'm going to give you 22, now we'll cut it down, <laughs> eight things that you must know. Oh, I shouldn't have said eight, because that makes people nervous if you take a real long time on one, you know. Uh, <laughs> About 30 minutes from now, I go, and two. <laughs> no. First of all, it's common sense. In order to get control of your life and get things back to normal, the God normal. You know, people keep talking about the new normal. or the No, I don't care about the new normal or, or the old normal. I want the God normal. I, I, want, I want God's life to be lived in my house and where I am. The first thing is you've got to be saved and filled with the Spirit. If, if, you want, <laughs> if you want the things of God to work in your life, you've got to be a Christian because the promises are to his children. And until you say, I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that God raised him from the dead, and I'm confessing that. Until you do that, you're not born again. But when you do that and you believe it in your heart, you're born again. My wife was uh, yesterday with some uh, Catholic people. And she, she was talking to them, and, and uh, they're friends. And she said, uh, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And they go, well, of course we do. She said, do you believe that Jesus Christ, that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead? Well, of course she said, and you would proclaim that. Well, I'm proclaiming it right now. She said, well, then you're born again. They go, we are? <laughs> we are? Does that make us Baptists? What's that, you know? <laughs> no. You know, God's not concerned whether you're a Presbyterian, Episcopalian, or whatever. He's concerned whether you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that God raised him from the dead, and you confess it. And all this other stuff is good to know, and it can change your life. But what gets you into heaven is that. And you're not going to get your life under control until you receive Jesus. Because uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
Old things have passed away and all things have become new. You want things to become new? You got to let old things pass away. And how do you do that? You become born again because when you become born again, old things pass away. Let me tell you, sometimes it takes years. But if you seek God, you will lose the taste for what you used to like to taste. And you'll acquire a taste for the things of God that you never thought you would ever want. Somebody says, well, what'd you do on your vacation? I went out of town and took a Bible class for a week. Somebody says, that sounds boring. No, that was fun. That's my summation. When I get to this piece of paper, you'll know. <laughs> All right. Number one, is everybody saved? If, you're, if, you're, if you weren't, you got saved a few moments ago when we talked about that, right? Okay. So the first thing, you've got to be saved. Number two, you've got to give God the same respect in your home that you give him in church. I know that just sounds strange, but you, you cannot live one way at church you say, well, at church, I have to act so holy. Well, quit acting holy and just be holy. Quit acting like a Christian and just be a Christian. We're not actors. I have to act that way at church. Well, no, no, why don't you be yourself? Well, you wouldn't like that. <laughs> why? See, yourself is, is who God sees. God doesn't see who you're acting like. Ah. Uh. Number three, see how quick these are going? Number three, treat your spouse with respect. Got that, James? Okay, all right. You're taking notes. Loretta, Loretta has this scripture on our refrigerator at home. <laughs> it says, it starts out, husbands. Oh, man. Why did God have to put this in here? But it's in the Bible. Hey. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding. James, look at Ashley and say, I understand you. Yeah, okay. Husband, they have a good marriage, by the way. I'm just picking on him. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. It doesn't say she is the weaker vessel. <laughs> I had a couple come in my office and they went, went to talk about spousal abuse. And I said, how, how long has he been beating you? And, and he said, it's not her, it's me. <laughs> She's been beating me. Oh, well, that's another story. Okay. Giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and being heirs together of the grace of God that your prayers may not be hindered. You may be asking God to get something straight in your life, but this scripture says right here, Husbands, if you don't treat your wife right, if you don't give her respect and honor, it will hinder your prayers. I see all you guys back there doing this. Come on. I know that the women all like me right now. to the next page. <laughs> Number four, control your thoughts. 2 Corinthians 10, 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down. Now listen to this. God has given you the power to do this. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every what? Thought. Every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You control what you think. And if you're not controlling what you think, because you think you can't control what you think, then you have bought the lie of the enemy. 
the enemy, I, you have no idea how many people have said to me, well, I, I know I, I'm thinking about this all the time, I just can't stop. Yes, you can. The reason you can't is because you say you can't and you believe you can't, but the truth is you can. God would never tell you to do something in his word that you couldn't do. I said he will never tell you to do something you cannot do. He will never give you something that you don't ha to do something that you don't have authority over. You say, well, I just can't quit thinking about it. Quit saying you can't quit thinking about it. Part of your problem is, is you keep saying you can't quit thinking about it. You've got to start saying, I am the master of my house. I control what comes in and what goes out and what goes on there. I control what goes on in my house. My house is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I do not have to have, I do not have to have, and I can cast out every vain imagination, every evil thought, every thought of hatred, every thought of lust, every thought that I should not be thinking. I can control it, and I'll control it by just casting it out. Now, your mouth always overrides your thoughts. You need to understand that. That's why the Bible strictly tells us so many times it's important what we say. What we say is extremely important because what you say controls what you think. You're driving down the highway and you have a lustful thought. Then start saying John 3.16 out loud. Turn off the radio and say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What thought? You're still trying to get in there? Say it again. Try to think of a different scripture. Don't say the same scripture over and over and over so it becomes just common. Come up with a new one. And just see how many scriptures you can come up with. You say, well, what good does that do? It'll, it'll control your thoughts. It'll drive those thoughts out. See, and, and years ago I was in a psychology class, which I have a degree in psychology also, which probably has done me, well, I shouldn't say that because I get what I say. Okay. Um, they did an experiment, uh, and I know many of you have already done this many, many times, but uh, we're going to start counting backwards from 100, okay? And we're going to do it as a group, out loud, and then when I tell you to stop, I want you to stop saying the counting out loud, but continue to think it at the same pace, all right? And continue, all right? Ready? 100, 99, 98, 97, 96, 95, 94. Now turn to the person on your right and tell them your first name your legal first name, the one that's on your birth certificate. Now give them your social security number. <laughs> what number are you on? What number are you on? You're, you're supposed to be counting backwards now. What number are you on? Yeah, like 81, I guess, or what? No, come on. You lost count. You lost count. Why'd you lose count? Because because your mouth started saying something different than what you were thinking. And when your mouth starts saying something different than what you're thinking, and it's a God principle. See, God says, whatever's good, lovely, pure, think on these things. Whatever's evil, cast down those vain imaginations. He tells us what to think about. He tells us what not to think about. Why? Because life and death are in the power of the tongue. And as a man thinketh, this is scripture, as a man thinks, so is he. And the more you think it, the more you say it, and the more you say it, the more it gets into your heart. And once it's in your heart, out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks, and when it's out of the abundance of your heart, it comes out as either faith or fear. Number five, control your words. I think we just uh, pretty well covered that. John 6, 63, it says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Jesus said this, The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. 
The scripture tells us that when the Israelites grumbled in their wilderness, that their words went up before the throne of God. God heard their words. What does God hear? He hears your words. Well, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a lie. Sticks and stones may temporarily break your bones, but your words are eternal. Proverbs 18, 21, by the way, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Number six, remember I said there are eight, so we're getting close. All right. Number six, remove sin from your home and repent. Hidden sin, now listen to me, hidden sin is just as evil, as wrong, as open sin. Just because somebody doesn't see you do it doesn't mean you didn't do it. You cannot hide it from God. Now, a principle in the Scripture, and you have to take this in context, if you're a born-again believer, you are born again, and you're sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. But here's a principle. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23. It'll bring death. Now, it may not be everlasting life death, but it'll bring death to relationships. It'll bring death to the way you feel about yourself. If you're living a life of sin, you don't feel good about yourself. You may be hiding it in front of everybody else, but you don't feel right. If you're a born-again believer, you don't feel right. Romans 6, 14 says, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Hmm. See, religion itself doesn't set you free. Just because you go to church doesn't set you free. Many religious practices have no fruit whatsoever. Religion won't get rid of sin. Only the blood of Jesus gets rid of sin. Hmm. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but thank God for His grace. 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Romans 5, 17, For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. If you want to reign in life, if you want to be king of your house, then just allow the grace of God to work in you. God, you see, quit saying, I can't do it. Quit saying, I can't change. Because according to the word of God, Mark eleven twenty three, 23, you get what you say. That's what Jesus said. If you believe in your heart that what you say will come to pass, you'll have whatever you say. That's a direct quote from Jesus. <clears throat> get as much of the word as you can, and things will become easier. Number seven, you must know who you are in Christ. See, when, if you know you're a child of the king, when you sin in the flesh, now your spirit man's cleansed, your spirit man does not sin, but your flesh hasn't been born again yet. And when you sin, you need to have the attitude, I'm going to run to God instead of from God. Are you following me? You run to him because that's where the grace is. That's where the forgiveness is. Uh, you may not feel worthy because of your past, and you know, a lot of us have a, have a past. But the neat thing about the past is it's past. All right. You can't change your past, but you can overcome your past. Hmm. The enemy's going to try to get in your garden. But what, what do you do if, if you were to see a snake in your house? I'd kill that puppy. That thing, uh, it'll look like a sliced up Subway sandwich before I get done with it. Man. But you need to feel the same way about when sin comes into your house. And you can know the truth of who you are. Number eight. <laughs> and you don't even know what the point is. Number eight, do not rejoice when the pastor's nearly done. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> oh. 
you know, back in my rock and roll days, back when we were traveling and on the road and making albums and all that kind of stuff, we used to do encores. <laughs> uh, never mind, never mind. Number eight. We must, <laughs> we must be led by the Spirit. That's number eight. And I get this from my son. This, this message used to have seven points, but Robbie gave me eight. Robbie says the answer to every question, and I say this a lot, the answer to every question is be led by the Holy Spirit. What should I do? Be led by the Holy Spirit. Should I go here? Be led by the Holy Spirit. Should I buy this suit? Be led by the Holy Spirit. How do you like these shoes? Be led by the Holy Spirit. Everything. See, man has an advantage over animals. We are a three-part being. According to 1 Thessalonians 5.23, we are spirit, soul, and body. We have a spirit, and we can be led by the spirit. For as many, Romans 8.14, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. It doesn't say for us, now, now follow me on this. The Bible does say believe the prophets and you honor teachers and all that kind of stuff. But it doesn't say for as many as are led by the prophets. As many as are led by the pastors. As many as are led by the most popular speaker out there. No. As many as are led by the Spirit. Wow, that's powerful. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons, the children of God. Our spirit is born again. Our spirit has the Holy Spirit living inside of it. In fact, to a degree, our spirit and Holy Spirit have become one. That was what Jesus wanted. And if you are led by the Spirit, you will never do anything wrong. If you're led by the Spirit in what you say, you'll never say anything wrong. And in review, number one, you want to get control of a life, your life, a life that may be out of control or controlled by other people. Number one, first of all, you've got to be born again. Number two, you've got to give God the same respect in your home that you give him in church. Number three, you've got to treat your wife right. Number four, you've got to control your thoughts. Number five, you've got to control your words. Number six, remove sin from your home. Number seven, know your place in Christ. And number eight, be led by the Holy Spirit. And that's all, folks. One more song. I'll give you a scripture. I'll give the uh, video department time to look it up. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. We'll close with this scripture. This is a scripture that changed my life. The people from Florissant and, and their friends from St. Louis, uh, they sat over on this side, and there's too many people to get over to get out early. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> so I'll, I'll tell you something about me that you probably don't know everybody else knows. I used to be the pastor of a Southern Baptist church. Uh, my license and ordination is with the Southern Baptist. Uh, I went to, I was born into a Baptist home. My mother is a Baptist Sunday school teacher. My dad was an ordained Baptist deacon. I got saved in a vacation Bible school, a Baptist vacation Bible school, and got baptized at the age of 12 in First Baptist Church in Raytown, Missouri. I got called to preach when I was the uh, special music at the Southern Baptist Convention. And uh, then I went to a Baptist college where I met a Baptist girl studying to be a Baptist missionary. And, and we got married in a Baptist church. And we had two Baptist children. And I became the pastor of Fortuna, which, by the way, that's a Greek god. I don't know why they named it Fortuna. Uh, but I became the pastor of the Fortuna Baptist Church. And uh, I believed everything a certain way. And, and I used to really believe that the best Christian in the world was a spirit-filled Baptist. You know. But one day I ran across a scripture 
Because I used to preach that God's word always works. It always works. Without fail, it always works. And then I ran across the scripture and I didn't know what to do. And it put me on a quest to make a decision that I'm not going to call myself a Baptist, a Presbyterian. My dad was a Presbyterian. A Presbyterian, a Methodist, a whatever. I'm just going to be somebody that believes the Word of God. And if the Word of God says something different than what I believe, I'm going to change what I believe instead of trying to alter the Scriptures. One day I ran across the Scripture. It says, For indeed the gospel, the good news, was preached to us as well as to them. But the Word, what Word? The gospel, that they heard did not profit them. Boy, that bothered me. It did, the word didn't profit them. And then it goes on to say why. Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. And that put me on this quest. God's word is true, but it's only activated by faith. Salvation, that's how we get saved. Jesus died for everyone in the whole world. He died for Adolf Hitler. He died for Saddam Hussein. You know, he, he died for Osama bin Laden. You know, he died for Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> no, he, 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 he did. And Donald Trump and everybody else, okay? And me and you, all right? He died for everybody. But does everybody get saved? Well, why not? The Bible says it's God's will that none should perish, but that all should accept him. That's God's desire but why doesn't he get what he wants? If he wants everybody saved, why doesn't he just make everybody saved? Because the spiritual principle woven throughout the scriptures is that you only receive what you believe. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. He paid the price for everybody. That whoever believed in him, so then I began to realize all these promises in the Word of God, all these things about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, all, all these healings. I, you know, I'd never seen any of those things in my life. Why not? Why not? Well, I didn't believe that they were for today. I believe they passed away. And I started reading the Word of God for what the Word of God actually said. And then I started, I started actually believing it. And I began to realize what we can believe, we can receive. And there's a lot of good stuff. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father. He's got a lot of good gifts, but we got to believe that he gave them to us. If we can't believe that, we won't receive them. We receive salvation because we believe that, but then we stop there. So, stand up. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. Hallelujah, Father. We love you. We love your word. And we receive it. We believe it. In the name of Jesus, amen. If I could have some music, Ryan and Robbie, I'd like for you two to stand here. Marla, for women, if there's any women that come forward. If you would like to have prayer today for anything, we believe in the power of prayer. We believe in the power of the Word. We believe in laying hands on the sick for them to recover. We believe that Jesus came to heal the broken heart. If you would like to have prayer today, we're here for you. If for some reason today was the first day that you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, they just come up and shake one of their hands and say, today I receive. God bless you all. We love you.